you know, we, we talked a little bit there about different things going on in tertiary analysis, including the concept of functional predictions. I'm curious of those of you who are, who are here, how many have ever used tools like SIFT or Polypen2 in an analysis project? I see several hands, quite a few. How many of you know how those work? <laughs> oh, good, we have some. Oh, yeah, because I, I, I did give a webcast on this subject just last week. I, I'm going to reprise part of that webcast today and just quickly brush through how some of these functional prediction algorithms work. Then we'll go back into SVS again and show a few more functions that we didn't get around to yet. And we'll go from there. So uh, we, we already went through a sample workflow of what typically happens with sequence analysis. You know, a lot of times the standard workflow is you start with a whole bunch of variants and maybe go through a series of QC steps and filtering based on inheritance status or zygosity state, kind of filter down to the types of variants you're looking for. And often you're left with a big long list of things that need to be prioritized at the end. You might have dozens, you might have hundreds, you might have thousands. And that last step down there, prioritizing those remaining variants, can really be tricky. And there's a lot of functional prediction algorithms out there that get used from time to time in this setting. I mean, there's other ways to prioritize variants too. A lot of people will um, use a list of candidate genes related to their particular phenotype, or you might, you know, if you're looking at a, an expected dominant trait, there are um, catalogs of haploinsufficient genes, things like that, that you can look into that may um, help guide your search, but quite often we find ourselves looking at some of these prediction tools and thinking, wow, those, those look kind of tempting. Maybe we should give it a try, see how they work. And, um, you know, if you look at the published information about all these different prediction tools that are out there, generally the, the comparisons that people have done to benchmark the functional predictions will usually show that you have pretty similar ROC curves, sensitivity, uh, specificity on most of these algorithms, and they all have between you know, 65 to 80 percent accuracy. But those uh, benchmarks are always done using a set of SNPs that are known to be damaging and comparing it to a set of SNPs that are expected with uh, you know, a lot of supporting information to not be damaging. And if you apply it to just a broad range of SNPs that you don't know anything about, you find there's a lot of disagreement. So this is a chart showing five different functional prediction algorithms that we're going to talk just a little bit about today. And you can see that, you know, out of, in this case, I think there were about um, 2,000, no, 10,000 total non-synonymous SNPs that were examined. About 30% of them were um, predicted to be damaging by at least one of these five algorithms and only 25 that were uniformly, consistently predicted damaging. And this is the kind of thing you see a lot. We're going to talk just a little bit about how all these different algorithms work and why they sometimes disagree. And to understand that we kind of need to go back and look at the basics of molecular biology to figure out how these algorithms work. And of course, we've been talking mostly about DNA here so far this afternoon. But these algorithms are all based on protein and amino acid sequencing. And so, of course, DNA is transcribed to RNA. RNA is translated into a sequence of amino acids. And every amino acid is unique. Uh, they all have different chemical properties, different um, formational properties that uh, affect how the protein is shaped and how it functions. And based on that primary sequence, so the primary structure of amino acids, it folds up, as we all know, into different secondary structures called alpha helices and beta sheets. Those then will usually fold up more and form a tertiary structure, so it's this big three-dimensional blob of amino acids that we call a protein. 
and then quite often multiple tertiary structures will interact in a quaternary protein structure. And you can imagine then that if um, any of those amino acids gets switched, it can have some pretty drastic effects. And it looks like my slide got messed up here just a little bit. But uh, you know, each protein has different functional domains, binding sites, surface features that are a result of its tertiary structure. And if the tertiary structure in particular gets messed up, it can have drastic consequences. And the problem is, as we see here, we don't know that 3D structure for very many proteins. Right? We know some, but not enough. If we did know them all, then functional predictions would be a lot more accurate than they are. But we can use the primary structure, and that's how these algorithms all work. They're based on that amino acid sequence to predict what's happening in the tertiary structure. And we can go back about a dozen years. There are some really important papers that kind of laid it all out. They point out that the vast majority of disease-causing mutations known at the time affected protein stability or structural stability. And you can use structure and stability criteria to detect, again, about 90% of known disease-causing mutations at the time. And because most proteins have homologous, similar related proteins either elsewhere in the genome or in different species separated by speciation. We can compare sequences to identify which amino acids are conserved and using some of the expected rules of evolution, figure out that if that particular domain of the protein is highly conserved, it's probably something that matters and we can use it to predict whether or not a mutation is going to have functional consequences. And so the kind of the intermediate step here is the multiple sequence alignment. And this little image kind of demonstrates how it works, but we can look here and see um, several different homologous proteins where the primary sequence is all laid out horizontally and in columns we see all of the individual amino acid identifiers. And we can see that certain columns, like this column here that's all E's, this pink one, some are highly conserved, others are not well conserved, and we can expect that these ones that are consistently conserved across species and across um, duplicate genes elsewhere in the genome are going to have functional importance. So these multiple sequence alignments that are used can include lots of homologous sequences and um, 700 or more depending on the algorithm. And we won't go into too much detail here about it except that all of the functional predictions use a multiple sequence alignment, but exactly how they use it is where they really differ. So the, the last point I want to make before we review any of these individual algorithms is that there are two basic classes that we're going to see. And <clears throat> I call them trained and untrained methods. Um, there's one particular method that doesn't totally fall into either one, but we'll call it weighted and put it in the trained side for today. But um, how many are familiar with machine learning techniques, so training and um, test data. So the, the first major category, these uh, trained algorithms, are ones that look at a set of variants that are known to be damaging, a set that are known to be non-damaging, and use the features present in those variants to build a model that is then used to predict whether or not a given observed variant somewhere else is likely to be damaging or not. And the exact test data, not test data, the training data they use to train those algorithms is really important in how they perform. And we'll see an example of that in a moment. And then the untrained algorithms um, don't use that same kind of an approach of, of you know, a <clears throat> a naive training process where there's no human involvement there. Based on a theoretical model, 
with a lot of human involvement in it. But they do incorporate important prior knowledge about the types of mutations that are expected to cause disease. And the nice thing there is they may not carry all of the same biases that we might see with a weighted you know, trained algorithm that's looking for particular types of things. So examples of untrained would be SIFT and Mutation Assessor. Those are both um, pretty well known. Polyfen is an example of a trained algorithm, also Mutation Taster, which may not be known quite as well as Polyfen. So we're going to look at five of these algorithms today. Um, we'll won't go into too much depth on any of them, but the reason I'm selecting these five is they are the ones that are available in SVS through the database of non-synonymous uh, functional predictions that we looked at earlier with the Ogden syndrome data. We'll just talk a little bit about how each one works. And as I mentioned this morning, or not this morning, in the first half, DBNSFP does have a completely free version that you can download and use. The website is there at the bottom. It comes with a little Java program that you can feed a BCF file into it, and it will give you back about 75 variables for each variant in your file. It's a lot of really nice data. Um, it includes actually six functional prediction scores. There's a log ratio test that um, we don't include with the version in SVS, and it's maybe not quite as advanced as the others are, if I understand it correctly. But um, let's start out by talking about SIFT. SIFT has been around for a long time, and it really hasn't changed much over the years. And you know, the original research supporting SIFT goes back to 2001 and earlier. The paper citing the method that's generally used today dates back to 2003 and has got tons of citations. But the way it works is um, very similar to how a lot of these others work. So we'll talk about SIFT in a bit more detail. But it relies entirely on sequence. It does not consider any structural features of the protein. Like we already said, most proteins we don't know the structure of anyway. But it uses a multiple sequence alignment to, um, based on BLAST to collect the set of sequences that go into that alignment. And it considers a few questions in the algorithm. It considers, one, is that position in the alignment highly conserved? Is the position conserved for amino acids with a particular charge, polarity, other chemical property? And finally, it asks, how different is the mutant amino acid from the most common amino acid in the sequence alignment? So not only does it consider, is the um, location conserved, but um, whether it's conserved or not, how different is what we've observed from what is usually found there across different species. And then it uses all that to calculate a score, and just based on a hard threshold in the score, it's either determined to be tolerated or deleterious. And so this is an example of what the output looks like. It actually considers all 20 amino acids at every position when you use the basic version of the algorithm. And so each possible amino acid is classified either as not tolerated or tolerated. And you can see this matrix of scores is another way to look at it. And anything that's in red is not going to be tolerated and black is. We can see, for example, at this position 13 that there's only one amino acid, only one residue that's going to be tolerated there. Everything else is expected to cause some kind of damage. And similarly, we see the same up here in this upper table. So um, one of the important things to recognize with SIFT, and it also applies to the other algorithms, even though they aren't quite as explicit about it, SIFT is very open about recognizing its own flaws. Uh, which I appreciate having read through all of their papers. They, they discuss um, things very openly. But I'll just read the exact quote from the paper. It says, confidence in a substitution predicted to be deleterious depends on the diversity of the sequences in the alignment. If the sequences used for prediction are closely related, then many positions will wrongly appear conserved, leading to a high false positive error. So you can imagine that if you have a protein that does not have 
very many homologs, and the homologs it does have are all practically identical to it, then any sort of a change in the primary sequence is going to appear very unusual. And what you end up with, they plot this on a conservation score versus the accuracy of the prediction. You get to a point where the conservation gets really high and the overall accuracy drops off fast. You do see that your true positive rate goes up, but the false positive rate is unacceptable. So when you use SIFT, it will always give you this conservation score side by side with the actual prediction, and if it's above three and a quarter, they say be careful and you probably don't want to use it. So we won't go into all the details about it, but SIFT does have a website that you can look at and um, submit all of your variants interactively on their website. So Polyfen is, um, together with SIFT, they make probably the two most common algorithms that get used, and it is substantially different under the hood in how it works. And um, it is one of these trained algorithms that we mentioned using a naive base classifier. And um, it looks at a bunch of questions similar to the questions that SIFT asks, but it, again, it's basing them on a training data set. And it looks at both the wild type and the observed alternate amino acid that are in the data, and it says, you know, how likely are each of these to occupy that position in the sequence based on this um, PSIC score, uh, which is rather complicated. We won't go into how it's calculated today, but you can look it up if you want. And then it looks at the first protein that has anything other than the human wild type and says, how distant is that from human? And then it also looks at whether or not that site is hypermutable. So it goes back to just the basic conservation in a way. In this little schematic, the one thing I'll point out is box two. It says that when it's um, building multiple sequence alignment, it uses sequences with a maximum homology up to 94%. I think that's how it's accounting for that high homology problem that SIFT pointed out. Is they just don't let anything too similar get in there. And it uses 11 different features in building the prediction score. These were selected from, a, I think they had about 30 candidate features that they used when they were building this, and their modeling told them that these 11 were the most important, that gave the best prediction. The thing I want to really point out, though, with Polyfin is that there are two different classifiers available in Polyfin 2 and it's important to know how they're different. And the main difference is that they use different training data to train the algorithm. And one of them uses a training data set which is really tuned to detect drastic effects on the protein, and it's best used when you're analyzing a Mendelian trait, and that one's called HUMVAR. Then the second one, called HUMDIV, is based on more of a diversity panel and the way it's set up is it's likely to classify even the mildly deleterious alleles as being damaging. It's intended to be used with complex disease analysis. And when you actually go in and try running Polyfin 2 on their website, they actually bury it down here in the advanced options, the choice of HumDiv or HumVar. It's important to think about that and use the one that applies to your data. A lot of people like to just run both of them. If you get the um, free version of DBNSFP, it will give you both of them. In SVS, we just give you uh, one of the two. We had to make the file small enough to reasonably be downloaded, and so we were selective in what we curated there. But the one that we curate is the HUMVAR that is intended for Mendelian trade analysis. But if there's demand for it, we'll also add HUMVAR. Now, uh, the next one I want to mention is Mutation Assessor. Mutation Assessor is a little bit newer than the others, but I've heard a lot of positive things about it. I've played with it quite a bit. I really like it. And the thing that makes it unique, there's a few things that make it unique, but in particular, 
It was designed with particular consideration for anal analyzing somatic variation in cancer. And rather than just talking about damaging or tolerated like the others do, they like to call things functional or non-functional. And they try to design a system that will classify loss of function or gain of function variants similarly. And they also try to capture different um, drug resistance variants, switch of function variants, things that happen in cancer. But they point out over and over again, you know, this also works in germline variation. I, I tend to agree after having played with it quite a bit. It actually agrees very well with SIFT and polyfin in most cases. And you see this nice little figure from their uh, paper indicating how with the, this is the TP53 transcriptional activity, so gain of function and loss of function variance. Either way, their impact score that they used increases. So this functional impact score is the basis for mutation assessment. The other thing that makes it different from SIFT or polyfin or anything else as far as I know is the way that they use protein subfamilies. And what that means is if you look at this example of a multiple sequence alignment, they're recognizing conservation as something that's conserved across the entire protein family. But they also calculate what they call a specificity score, which indicates conservation just within the subfamily of proteins. And um, honestly, I don't know a lot about how they're classifying subfamilies, but they are using some kind of clustering algorithm to do that. And then they combine those two scores, the specificity and conservation scores, to get the final functional impact score. And the interesting thing about those specificity residues, and again, that's something that nobody else seems to look at at all, but in their own analysis, they determined that those ones that are conserved only in subfamilies are predominantly located on protein surfaces in known or predicted binding interfaces and often directly linked to protein functional interactions. So they seem to have found a nice little trick that allows them to recognize particular amino acids that have a high tendency to be in functional regions, more so than just strict conservation of tellium. And one more thing I'll point out about mutation assessor that applies kind of universally to all of these algorithms is they calculate this quantitative score and a variant could fall anywhere across the spectrum. They're expecting the most damaging ones to be high on the spectrum and the neutrals to be far at the left, but there is some gray area in the middle. And so what they have to do is pick an optimal cutoff. And so they select this threshold at 1.938. And above that threshold, 78% of what's known to cause a disease scores higher. And at that same threshold, 78, roughly about the same proportion of common polymorphisms score lower. And so there is some gray area. There's about a 22% um, false negative rate you're dealing with up here. There's a, similarly about a 22% false positive rate you're dealing with down here. And all of these different classifiers have this same issue. Um, they're, they, they can't have perfect sensitivity and specificity on this. So also, I think that Mutation Assessor probably has the nicest website of the bunch. And I just want to quickly show you some cool things that you can do with this. So if I pull up a web browser, I actually already have this open. Uh, when you run Mutation Assessor, you do have to give it, um, there's a couple formats it takes. The standard format is a protein identifier with the amino acid change. And I'm just using the default example that they have here. You can choose a bunch of different outputs. So if I also wanted to get um, something about known functional regions and uh, information from Cosmic, I will just get one of these. If I selected everything, it would fill the screen and then some. 
But when you run this, it gives you all of that readout down here at the bottom. So I can see, for example, that this first one is in a functional region. It's in a protein binding site. It has some links to more information about small molecule binding sites. But also, it's nice in that it gives a link where I can see the actual sequence alignment that was used. I can see that um, right here, highlighted in the black bars, is the position of interest. And what we had was a G724S. I can never remember all of my amino acids, but uh, GNS. <laughs> um, so this one has a pretty high conservation score and kind of a moderate specificity score. We can look across and see, for example, over here is an example of something with high conservation, something with very high specificity. And we could even scroll down and see they use these gray bars to break out the protein subfamilies. So if you want to pick this one with high specificity, you could go through and kind of eyeball that pattern for yourself, although it is pretty big. But it's nice that they show this to you. If you're a data junkie and want to really dive into this, it's all there. Now the other fun thing that they give is a link to three-dimensional structure uh, cartoons from Protein Data Bank. And these are always fun. I'm not really good at this, but you can zoom in on it. You can see highlighted in red is the variant site of interest. Here we can recognize that it is surrounded by some highly specific and highly conserved residues. Similarly, if you get really good at it, there's a bunch of different views you can use to recognize different important factors around the surface, and uh, solvent accessible service, that kind of thing. And so it, I, I think Mutation Assessor provides a really nice environment for following up on things, especially if you are um, better at molecular biology and biochemistry than I am. Again, I'm a, I'm a statistics guy. So quickly, we'll just swing back here and look at a couple other algorithms. Um, so the next one I wanted to mention was Mutation Taster. Won't go into a lot of detail here, except that it does two things really well. Um, one is that it's the, about the only algorithm out there with native support for DNA alterations rather than amino acid substitutions. Because of that, they can give you classification data on SNPs outside of coding regions. You know, they have, for example, some predictions on SNPs that may affect uh, splice sites except ones that are upstream from the splice site that may affect that. They can also um, tell you about a few other important sequence motifs outside of exons. And um, another nice thing about it is that they have an interface that allows for direct upload of VCF files. It's limited to single sample VCFs, but if you just upload your VCF, it will go through and classify everything and send it back to you. And it's pretty popular service. When I checked a couple weeks ago, there were over 6,000 VCF files in the queue to be analyzed. Um, last week when I checked, it was down under 1,000 that had processed most of those. But it's definitely getting used. It is a little quirky. I won't get into all of the quirks. I've just seen some unusual things in the output. But uh, once you get used to how it works, it's a lot of fun. Um, or just very useful because of the way it handles non-coding regions and the fact that there's no manipulation if you've already got a standard VCF file. Oh, whoops, I keep clicking up instead of down here. So the last one I want to mention is Fathom. And Fathom, I mentioned earlier today, is kind of an oddball. It, it works very well, but it is fundamentally different from the others in that they make the argument that BLAST and other algorithms that are often used to identify homologous proteins have some inherent flaws. And um, I, I'm trying to remember the details on that, but specifically it has to do with gaps in the alignment sequence and how um, it handles gap alignments. And there's other issues beyond that one. But 
they believe that hidden Markov models are better for identifying homologous proteins. And so they start out by using hidden Markov models to build the MSA. And from there on, they're really not different than how any of the others work. They're actually, I think, very similar to SIFT in a lot of ways. They cite SIFT as uh, um, one of their inspirations for creating Fathom. And um, the other thing that it does that's interesting and unique is that they do include some manually curated databases for um, protein domains. So there are some recognized motifs and domains that are known to have um, specific types of functionality. They mix those into, I don't know if they go directly into the actual MSA that's used for conservation, but they are used to help identify variants that are in important functional regions. And um, here we see, again, that idea that there's never perfect specificity with these things. But they do have two versions, an unweighted and a weighted version. And they show that how when you use the weighted version, this area shaded dark are variants known to be damaging. You get better separation between the two distributions. You know, there's still some, um, you know, going to be some error that you've got to deal with, but generally they can separate known damaging from known, um, known neutral. And Fathom, like some of the others, has uh, local versions you can download and install. They also have their website. You can take a look at it. It's, it's, um, it's interesting. Now, let's talk just a little bit about how they all compare. If I mentioned earlier, if you go look at the various published comparisons, you see uniformly, usually, accuracy scores going from 65 to about 80 percent, again, using a benchmarking data set of known functional or disease-causing variations. And it differs. If you benchmark on one data set, one algorithm will seem the best. If you benchmark on another, another one will seem the best. It's not always consistent in that regard. What I like to do is actually compare them head to head. And here we see a couple figures. This is actually the same one from earlier in the presentation. But if you take this sample from 1,000 genomes, it's a HapMap sample. It's probably the most sequenced sample in history. It has about 10,000 total non-synonymous SNPs. About a third of them are called damaging by at least one of the five methods. But only 23 are uniformly called damaging. Similarly, we go outside of Europeans and look at Puerto Rican, who do have some European admixture. Um, about 10,000 total non-synonymous SNPs. This is based on complete genomics sequencing of these samples. About a third are called damaging, and a very small number are consistently called damaging. Look at two more samples um, from Asia and from Africa, similar patterns. Now, the other pattern here that's really interesting to me is in all four of these plots, you will see a couple of things. Number one is that the biggest crossover points are consistently right in these two cells. One is where SIFT meets polyphen. The other is where SIFT and polyphen combine with mutation assessor. And then also, just to the side of that, this is polyphen with mutation assessor, and down here where SIFT and mutation assessor come together. Those are always the biggest crossovers. Those three tend to be pretty consistent with each other. Mutation taster, on the other hand, is always the most conservative. It always calls the fewest to be damaging. And that might affect why it doesn't seem to light up in any of these other cells, because it just plain doesn't call as many. And then Fathom is always kind of the odd man out. And so I would consider Fathom to be more of a, an orthogonal method almost to the others. If you really want to have two very different methods and see how, you know, where they cross over, I would suggest maybe using Fathom together with one of these other three. Or if you want three methods that generally seem to give the same answer, then polyphen sift and mutation assessment are the way to go. Now, um, one 
Oh, and what I meant to say about Fathom is you see here about three-fourths of what it calls damaging, so it's called 1,000 to be damaging and 757 have no crossover with anything else. That's pretty consistent. Again, we see over here between two-thirds and three-fourths. We go back up to those others, again, about two-thirds, about three-fourths. So very little crossover there. And you know, if we look at all four of those samples and see you know, how many total non-synonymous SNPs there are, how many were completely benign in all five methods, and how many were called once, two, three, four, five times as being damaging, there's a couple other patterns here that are interesting. If you look at these 23 up here, they're uniformly damaging in this European sample. 13 of those 23 are cataloged in 1,000 genomes, and 11 have frequencies above 1%, so they're relatively common. Of course, we'd expect it to be cataloged in 1,000 genomes because this sample is part of that, but the fact that the frequency is above 1% um, on most of them is interesting. Now, the reason all 23 aren't there is because we're basing this on complete genomic sequence as opposed to the sequence from 1,000 genomes. Now, similarly, if we look at the NHLBI exome project, a lot of them are there and a lot of them are common. So not everything damaging is rare. And in fact, most of these that are classified as damaging may just um, explain very common phenotypic differences between people sitting in this room. You know, why some of us have red hair and why some of us have high arches and who knows what else. Now, uh, the other thing that I find interesting is down here at the bottom. When you look at this African sample, you see that in the total number of non-synonymous SNPs, it's increased about 15% over the baseline of the other three. But in the number that are uniformly damaging and even uh, called damaging anywhere, it is really elevated. And um, in this last column, that 38 is 65% higher than the median of 23 in these first three samples. And you know, we've heard it for years, African genomes are very diverse, and the human reference is biased toward European alleles, generally. And also, I believe that the protein sequences uh, used in MSAs are not necessarily used in MSAs, but the protein sequences that are the canonical reference proteins are similarly biased toward Europeans, and that's why we're seeing this elevation. It's um, not an indication of any particular disease-carrying status, really. So in terms of applying and using these, uh, most people that I talk to want to use a whole bunch of them and see how they line up, how they cross over. That's kind of the way things are going. I've also talked to a lot of people who just don't trust them at all and say, you know, I prefer to analyze my data differently, and when I get to the end, I might compare it to the functional predictions and see if there's any agreement, but I'm not going to base my analysis entirely on that. And I respect that opinion. I, I think that that is a wise approach as well. Um, you know, all of them, based on the benchmarking that I've seen, generally perform well when you have a set of variants that are known to cause disease. Pretty much all of them are going to find it most of the time. It's, this is the problem. When you have a million variants in a genome, or several million, or you know, several thousand in an exome, uh, and you don't know anything about any of them, most of these methods are going to call about 20% of them to be damaging. And um, remember also, we've got about a 22% false positive rate on these when you look at how everything lines up. And so um, just, just be aware that um, certain variants, especially rare ones, have a higher probability prior probability of being damaging. We don't expect highly damaging things to be common in the population or else we'd all be dead. But um, there, there are things you can do to you know, increase your prior probability that something's damaging before you run it through a functional prediction algorithm. And I'll kind of wrap up with this one. My 
anecdotal experience, when I look at when they don't agree with each other and what's driving that, you know, I, I took a bunch of variants called damaging by Sifton polyfin 2, but neutral by mutation assessor. And remember, those three are usually pretty similar to each other. And what I found is these ones called neutral by mutation assessor quite often had very low depth of coverage in that sequence alignment. And it seems that when it just doesn't have enough data to make a good prediction, it calls it neutral. It doesn't say it's missing or unable to predict. It seems to err toward just calling it neutral. And also, there is another bullet that I added in the other version of slides where I had all the text formatting problems. But um, if you look at that same set of variants in SIFT, a lot of them, and I think it's mostly the ones that had good coverage in Mutation Assessor, had extra high conservation scores indicating a high probability of a false positive result. So um, when they don't agree with each other, you can come back and find out, wow, this is a place where Mutation Assessor is known to mess up, this is a place where SIFT is known to mess up, and the ones where they agree tend to be more consistent. Now, if I turn it around and look where SIFT says tolerated and the other two say damaging, you know, this is kind of shaky, but it appeared to me as I manually reviewed some of these that the two amino acid options tended to be pretty similar to each other, and so I kind of got the idea that SIFT is more sensitive to chemical similarity while the others are relying more on conservation. And so that's why SIFT seemed to call more of these tolerated, but I, I'm not going to um, say that that's always the case. So, um, you know, we already saw this when I did that brief demo at the beginning of the day, looking at um, DDNSFP, but it is integrated with SDS. And with that, um, I'll rest my case and ask if you have any questions about these, and then we'll just go back and spend just a few minutes with SBS again, and I'll let you all go. So I, I kind of went through all of that fast. I saw a lot of people taking notes and looking up and down. And any thoughts, any questions? Did I say anything wrong or say anything that kind of tickled your funny bone? <laughs> no? Okay. Well, um, what I'd like to do then just to close, um, you know, I was going to go through just a quick demo with functional predictions again, but given the time we have and the fact that I know there are people with different interests in the room, I'm curious if you'd rather just see some other areas of SDS. Um, yeah? Like RNA-seq? RNA-seq. Um, RNA-seq, that's a very good question. Uh, I don't have a good data set today to demonstrate that. What we can do with RNA-seq is primarily differential expression testing. And um, if that's what you want to do, we've got a few different methods for it, specifically DE-seq. Uh, we went back to the original DE-seq papers and rewrote the method and benchmarked it against the R version, and that is fully implemented. I know a lot of people with RNA-seq are interested in novel transcript detection and um, novel splice detection. That's something that we consider to be upstream in the secondary analysis space. We, at the moment, don't get into that, but we do have the ability to visualize that kind of data in the browser. And I, I could show you lots of RNA-seq pileups, but we'll save that. Um, again, fusion gene detection is upstream from what we do. I mean, we're, we're mostly interested in phenotypic associations and um, not so much that nitty-gritty work of finding something that's new and different in a particular sample. What I'll show you here quickly, um, give me just a second to find this and pop it open. I think I have I just want to give you an idea of the range of topics that we can support with SDS. So this is going back in time. Is anyone here um, still working with GWAS data? Okay, half the audience. Awesome. So um, GWAS is where our software started out, and it's where we really shine to this day. You know, we support data sets of 
practically any size, and this is a really small one, practically speaking, but we've got about you know, 560 samples here and half a million SNPs. But we allow you to do all kinds of different association tests, all kinds of different um, QC work, so things like principal components and analysis. And this just opened up on my lower screen. So let's put that back up on the main screen. So principal components and analysis with you know, clickable points so you can see exactly which sample is at any given point. And you can get links back to the original data and come in and learn more about them. Similarly, we support things like um, IBD estimation. This is also opening on the other screen. So what I'm looking at here is a plot of pairwise um, IBD estimates across all of my data. And I can zoom in and see, oh, wow, these people look like they're related. So I can click there and see, oh, yeah, the um, estimated IBD is 50%. So they're probably first degree relatives. Um, I think what we have here is um, probably siblings and parents. It looks like maybe it's a family quartet or something. If we zoom back out um, and then come back, of course, we support all different types of association testing, regression-based associations. And this one's opening on the lower screen again. But you know, eventually, we hope to get you to a point like this where we're plotting p-values, both corrected and uncorrected, against the genome together with annotations to give you context about it, as well as, in this case, we've got LD plots where we can see the exact haplotype frequencies and case control status, or sorry, case control um, frequencies for each haplotype, even you know, have the ability to look at larger haplotype blocks and see you know, all of the most common haplotypes in that block, as well as their case and control frequencies with p-values. Lots of fun stuff there. Um, yeah. Well, um, you can do IBD with sequencing data. It, it requires a little bit of processing. But of course, with calculating IBD, you want to have a set of markers that are well called and very informative. Informative meaning a high minor allele frequency and um, relatively uncorrelated. And so you've got mostly independent SNPs. And so I've actually done that several times, even very recently. Um, all you need to do is take all of those SNPs, run it through a minor allele frequency filter, then run it through the LD pruning algorithm that's in here, and you're ready to go. Questions? Right here. So um, yes, yes, and I don't know if I've got a really good example to show, but we'll, I'll show something that's bigger than what we've got here. And where did it go? It's going to be this one. So this is just chromosome 12 and only the Europeans from 1,000 genomes, and so it's only, I guess, 3 quarters of a million. But yes, we've, we've had spreadsheets open before with 30 million columns of data. Uh, it does slow things down. It slows it down a lot. And if you have data like that, we can work with you on some strategies to kind of optimize how it works. But this, the architecture of the software is robust in that regard. Yeah. I have a quick question. So when you do IBD, mm -hmm. it's local IBD and it's global IBD. Mm -hmm. But my interest is to look at A genes, but meanwhile, I'm interested to look at local IBD. Mm -hmm. How many like KB or MB like would you recommend? It's really reliable. That's a hard one. So the algorithm here that we're using for global ID IBD is the same algorithm that's in Plink. It's our own implementation of it, and it's based on allele sharing. And it's you know for your case, are you working with families? It didn't have to be families. Okay. Also, because yeah. you know in but families. Honestly, if you're interested in local IBD with families, I would say to go use something like Merlin. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we don't have good support for that. But um, in general, I would say you at least need to have several hundred 
SNPs that are uncorrelated to get a decent IBD statistic from this allele sharing model. And you need to have a lot of samples too because it's looking at the allele frequencies in your population to determine the empirical expected sharing ratios. Okay. Oh, oops. Other questions? Yeah. Hmm? Yes. Um, the question was, does it handle imputed data? And we can, uh, you know, we actually have imports that are built right in for taking output from Eagle and the output from Impute2 and Mock. And you can either work with the actual SNP calls. I mean, a SNP call is any diploid genotype we can deal with. And if you want to work with the, uh, sorry, the allelic dosage outputs, it just becomes a numeric variable. And you know, down here in, well, I'm in the wrong spreadsheet. But if we go back to that project we were in with the GWAS data, and you know, we ended up down here at the end running this. Um, whole genome regression based on numbers representing the SNPs, so we had converted it to numbers along in part of the workflow. If you have uh, allelic dosage from imputation, it would be exactly like this. You'll just have uh, floating point numbers instead of integers, and it, it's, it's seamless. And we, we do that a lot, especially in our services. We've helped a lot of people do imputation and then analyze the imputation output. Something I've done a lot. So, um, for computing key values is why we did this. Our, the, the current version of our regression analysis only runs on numbers, so we, we have to convert the genotypes into numbers before we run it. And um, but that is if we want to be able to adjust for any other variables. And I think in this example project, we were correcting for sex and principal components, and so that's why we did it that way. Um, something else I'll show, actually I won't show because I don't have it on the on this computer. We, there was a question during the break about what we do with the copy number variation. And we have tools in CMD for working with array-based copy numbers. So if you have array CGH or if you have SNP arrays, um, we have tools for identifying copy number changes and for visualizing and analyzing those. Um, although we don't right now do anything in CMD with, um, with sequence-based CMDs. Now the last thing I'll show since it came up in Yin's talk is this concept of rare variant collapsing. And I briefly showed this spreadsheet already. This is the 1,000 genomes, one chromosome just for the Europeans. But to give an idea of how it works, I went through a series of steps. And this is something I didn't emphasize in the demo this morning. It's how it keeps notes for you, so you can always retrace your steps and know what you did. But I started by filtering to a um, minor allele frequency greater than 1%. Oh, actually. I'm trying to remember what I did. This was a long time ago. This was just a sample workflow. Let's go down to this one. This was more interesting. So starting from this whole genome data set, um, filtered, or all of, whole chromosome, we'll call it, filtered to exon regions only, then compared it to the NHLBI exome data, and um, I don't remember the frequency. Okay, right there. I filtered it to a frequency of greater than 1% in NHLBI. So I just kept the rare ones based on that, then ran coding variant classification. And this is interesting to look at because when we did the Ogden syndrome, everything was either synonymous or non-synonymous. If we look here, we'll find there's a lot of different types of variation when you've got the whole chromosome like this. So we can see that there's frame shifts, there's non-synonymous SNBs, stop loss, stop gain. Um, <clears throat> all sorts of different things going on here. But after reducing it to, what did I keep? I kept non-synonymous SNPs and frame shift mutations, then ran it through a KBAC test based on having a simulated binary phenotype. 
you end up getting outputs in the form of p-values for the KVAC test, where if we zoom out to the big picture, this was using a permutation test that was capped at 10,000 permutations. So our um, smallest p-value is 10 to the minus fourth is the smallest possible. This one probably would have gone higher with more permutations. But you know, we can zoom in to the point of seeing what gene this is in. We'll give it a moment to update down here. It's this gene right here. And zoom into it. This, is, I think, is reading off of my external hard drive right now. That's why it's going slow. But we can see this p-value of 10 to the minus fourth is in this gene down here in this plot. If I adjust the grouping and group this based on the simulated phenotype, this green bar indicates the cases versus the controls. So I had a lot more controls in here than cases. But over here to the right, you can see that down here we've got a lot of variations showing up in the cases but not in the controls. So I can zoom down in here, maybe go back out to the width of the gene. Come on. It's not responding to me. We'll do it this way. But this is an example of the type of rare variant burden test that Ian talked about a little bit. This may not be a perfect example, but you get the idea that this KVAC test is designed to identify these regions where there's a lot of rare variants, even though it's not always the same variant, but there's more in the cases than in the controls. And so that's another area that we support. And this is just uh, to show that we can also represent and visualize larger numbers of variants than just those five samples that we had with, Cape, or with um, Ogden syndrome this morning. And if I come up here to the original data and activate this and draw one of those again, you can see the kind of density you get with uh, about 400 samples and a lot of different types of variants. And it's pretty dense, but again, we've tried to design everything to be robust to large data sizes and to handle a lot of different types of questions that you might ask in your data.